Josh. Josh loves drumming. When he's not practicing, he's performing. And when he's not performing, he's practicing. Oh, and did we mention? Josh loves drumming. And that's why he chooses D-Bud. Hey, Josh, show us your skills. Thanks, Josh. Noise harms your health. Josh knows that. He also knows that gigs get very loud. D-Bud's volume slider means that he can slide from minus 11 decibels to minus 24 decibels in the flick of a switch. And that's why Josh loves D-Bud. The problem with cheap earplugs is they often kill both the volume and the sound. The lower tones cut through the earplugs more than the higher ones. The bass overpowers the treble. There's an uneven attenuation of high and low frequencies, an unbalanced distorted sound. Yes, they protect your ears, but you get a muffled and dull sound experience. D-Bud isn't like that. Don't lose your hearing or peace of mind. Get D-Bud today. I've always been, it sounds ridiculous, so I've always been musical because I'm not very good at playing music and um, bar being able to do kind of three chord tricks on the guitar but um my dad is very musical my mum is as well and so and Irish family it's kind of a given that it's going to be part of your childhood I had a very um very different sets of musical tastes for my parents and my dad is like hardcore country music um wall-to-wall -wall, uh, kind of the kind of the most kind of honky tonk that you can get is is his kind of taste and then my mum is really has always been into reggae I and mean, she grew up in Tottenham in London so she's into that kind of a scene so I've my iTunes is like some kind of schizophrenic nightmare although I I like it it will go from <laughs> kind of like trad Irish music to um bashment and uh, and I like it but it means that I can't really ever share it share um my playlist or at parties because it's a bit over eclectic but yeah it's um it, it's what i love if i wasn't um working in where i'm working in politics i'd want to do something related to music i've always in choirs i've always just loved it so yeah it's a big part of my life yeah i can see some musical instruments in the, in the background there and uh <laughs> and I, I i loved the uh the records um that that you kind of noted down as being some of your favorite songs um you know, the first being Time Has Told Me by Nick Drake. When did you start listening to Nick Drake? When I was really young. Um, and I I, I kind of li like a lot of his stuff. I like Pink Moon and all that kind of thing. But it's mm. Time Has Told Me is just the most heartbreaking song that I've ever heard. Nothing's ever touched it. Um, obviously, as a teenager, I was really into him as a teenager. And as a teenager, the fact that he, his personal life and the fact that he took his own life and all of that kind of makes you more interested in him in this kind of morbid way where you have, you know, you're a teenager, and you're having these kind of like dark nights of the soul. You think your emotions are right up the Richter scale. Um, but as an adult, I mean, just the mastery he has of, uh, of music. And in that particular track, I mean, the words are just, he talks about death and life and mortality in a way that is just so poetic. Um, and I always cry when I hear it. It's just one of those ones that makes me cry. Um, but it is, it's beautiful i that is one of my favorite tracks ever yeah yeah nick drake died pretty young didn't he he did yeah which is kind of it, it, it like i said it's the kind it's a bit like reading sylvia plath the bell jar when you're a teenager you kind of have that sense there's always that sense with musicians who uh die young that there's it gives them an extra kind of uh, a deeper meaning but actually that's kind of can often feel quite cheap with someone like Nick Drake it doesn't actually if yeah. you didn't know anything about his personal life and you didn't know anything about the kind of massive bouts of depression that he had um I don't think it would matter because that no. that soulfulness um is reflected in his music anyway yeah yeah it, it absolutely is and um it, he's similar in some ways to to Joni Mitchell I mean they've they they started coming to the fore around the same time in the early 70s. Um, when was Hajira released by Joni Mitchell, which is your next tune? God, I don't know when it was released. 
um, I'm... So I hadn't heard it before, and, and I feel like I, I really should have. But um, you know, my knowledge on Joni Mitchell like is is good, but it's not you know as obsessive as some of those kind of great artists. Mm. Um, and I've just been getting getting into it more and more. I think I, I mean I think it was like mid to late seventies that that whole record. It's like the title track from a record. Yeah, and the the album itself is so she. It's the wonderful thing about her, and she is one of my favorite artists. My the first ever song I learned was Big Yellow Taxi on the guitar, and I played that in year four in an assembly. And um, there's a very embarrassing home video of it somewhere that my mum's got. But she, so she was kind of like the soundtrack to my um, childhood. Was she was my, what my mum introduced me to, and her albums are so. She's one of those artists. It's a, I think Laura Marling today is actually very like her, and I love Laura yeah. Marling. Um, yeah. But the thing about Joni Mitchell is not just that she's her, the you know lyrics that she writes are incredible, and I mean she plays around a number of very similar chords. But the stuff that she's playing on the guitar is is great but it's not it's not kind of crazy technically difficult but each of her albums is so different so the difference between blue or miles um miles of isles and then hegira is like it's actually i think it's hegira is a much more kind of grown up one and i mean it's a, i'm starting to sound like some kind of terrible dreary person because the thing about hegira is it has this line in it um about what it's like to be alive um and what it's like to be human she says something like, uh, each of us so deep and superficial between the forceps and the stone. And it's like, oh my God, what, what a line to write about life. It's kind of like Beckett. And, and so I, you know, the thing about Joni Mitchell is that she's got these wonderful, catchy, mm. sing-songy kind of melodies, but underneath it um, often is incredibly deep lyrics. I mean, all her, the way that she wrote about her daughter having to give up her daughter for adoption with songs like Little Green is just incredible. And, I, and you know, I don't often, um, I'm not a kind of a music fan that goes in for the, the person. I don't know a lot about the people that I like. I'm not kind of obsessive in that way. But one of the things about Joni Mitchell is that from a, from a perspective of kind of female artists, a bit like Laura Mar Marling, some of the stuff she writes about women and thinking like a woman and stuff she writes about marriage and things is just, it's, it's quite revolutionary for the time that she was writing in. Yeah, for sure. She was very groundbreaking. I do think it is about her musicality was great. And I mean, as you say, it doesn't need to be too technical. Um, when, when we had Crosby, David Crosby on the show, um, he was saying that, that he taught her, uh, that rather she taught him uh, jazz chords and things like that um so sometimes it's like not even that it's not difficult to play but it just sounds a bit different um and also the tunings that she was using um on the on the guitar just like give her that unique sound but then yeah it's the lyrics often with Joni Mitchell that really do mean a lot to people mm -hmm. um and yeah I, I, I'm really enjoying kind of getting to grips with her catalog more because obviously the album's like blue like everybody's heard mm -hmm. um but Hajira yeah, it's 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 such a wonderful album, and and she and she's so consistent till later on in her career. Now I, I was much less familiar with Paul Brady, nothing but the same old story. <laughs> he's kind of my guilty pleasure because he did he um, is sort of more most famous probably to his uh, he probably doesn't like it, but he's most famous for these early albums that he did with a guy called Andy Irvine, um, which were kind of. Uh, more in line with sort of Irish trad songs. Um, and they, I can't remember the name of the album, but it was it was sort of all these songs that were sort of from the Napoleonic era, um, kind of folksy songs. And they're really good, they're, I really like them. And he's sort of known for being able to sing songs like the Creole and Irish, traditional Irish um, songs. But then in this kind of period in the, in the sort of 80s and 90s, he did, he, didn't exactly get political but nothing but the same old story is one of these songs that every single Irish person in in the UK um coming to England in that time the 70s 80s 90s it just was exactly their experience it really encapsulates obviously I don't know that but it's my dad um who grew up in Ireland and uh, came over as an immigrant 
told me about and my grandparents, it's that sense of he really captures what it was like to be an Irish person in England at the time when it was a very dangerous thing to be an Irish person in England and persecution of Irish people was um, pretty rough. But he's he's also, like on the people I'm picking, an incredible musician. But if you look at the, uh, I don't like the studio versions of nothing but the same old story, but you look at the live version, which is on YouTube, the anger in, um, in his performance is just so uh, it's so moving, um, and it's one of those. It's a bit. It's one of those things where you kind of um, you can get a bit silly about it. So you can. I watch it and then I feel angry for um, for my dad or angry for my granddad. It's one of those things that stirs up a lot of emotions. Um, but it, it it as a song, it's brilliant and it applies to any kind of. It actually applies to any kind of immigrant. Um, story it's not just about Irish people but the particularities of um you know people in London who'd be living in and around Kilburn and being caught up in the pub because there's nowhere else to go because you were treated like crap everywhere you went that kind of thing um really comes through in the song so uh, that was my one that I do like to play really loudly in the car and, <laughs> and sing along <laughs> and is it, is, is it a similar story with Pat Patrick Street is a group isn't it Irish group yeah so and I believe Andy Irvine is in that as well. Um, I think Andy Irvine is this kind of is the geek is the kind of the geek Irish trad guy. He um, he plays all these kind of weird. He invented this um, instrument called the or he brought it into Irish music, and um, not the bazooki, but something like. And he's he's this kind of weird guy. He's got this weird whiny kind of voice that I actually quite like, um, but it's very particular to him. Him and a couple of people from Dedanon. Um, and some others, it's kind of like a super group of guitarists from Van Morrison's band formed wow. Patrick Street. And uh, it's one of those ones, lots of people know it. It's, and I could have picked, I mean, I'm obsessed with all different types of, I could have picked lots of obscure jigs from the Chieftains or, you know, jigs from Zanon, but this one, everyone knows it was in, it's in this great scene in um, uh, Napoleon Dynamite when he's running down the road which I quite like that film <laughs> and it's really it's it it's kind of the kind it encapsulates the high-paced nature of a lot of Irish trad music that's kind of the fun aspect of it um and I really like it but there are kind so, of weird, so one of these weird in, super groups yeah so they were um a super group from musicians from Van Morrison's band I think that yeah one of them was that one, the, one of them was from um Van Morrison's band is, is he still was, in the band now I'm not sure, but Van Morrison had all of the top um, and Van Morrison would have been in my top list. Um, just that I the changes every week. But I, the... I did. I read a um, I read an article that you wrote uh, about the concert that Van Morrison did at mm. the um, London Palladium, mm -hmm. um, which uh, we went to as well, uh, which, you know, it was so great to see that um, it was. Yeah. Just, in, I don't know, especially because he's such a sublime artist, such an incredible singer. But to see that in the midst of lockdown, it feels like it was honestly like being in some sort of weird alternate, you know, utopian universe just for one night. It was amazing yeah. going to that gig. And he's been really vocal about, I mean, he's gotten into trouble. Um, there was a, that he was given the, I think I wrote about it in the article, he was given the kind of the key to Belfast or some kind of, honorary thing in Belfast and they were some some councillors or politicians were talking about getting it taken away from him because he wrote a bunch of uh sort of anti-lockdown songs or songs that were critical mm. of lockdown coming from the perspective of him his he lives and breathes live music and so he was saying my band and all these other musicians can't survive under lockdown um there was a kind of some people argue there was a bit of a whiff of uh maybe like a just a whiff of conspiracy theory about some of the things that he said but mainly he was arguing that like live music and the scene of live music was going to die if you kept these restrictions up and so there was big controversy around him but for him to actually go on and put on that and the London Palladium were great about it they they said look we're going to do this even if it means you have to sit apart and all that kind of stuff but they actually t it actually is when performances like that become political when you're t when you're taking a stand and coming from a man who has quite studiously been not involved in politics you know it's coming from yeah, where he comes from in all the manners and always trying really. to no always avoiding any kind of uh being entangled in any politics like that to come out strongly on this was quite remarkable and i think lots of people appreciated it because 
well, we've just had the news now that they're kind of putting off Glastonbury and the scene for musicians is looking very dire. Yeah, yeah, they've yeah, they cancelled Glastonbury today. And I've just seen an article, um, well, a few articles, BBC, all, all the major ones, Telegraph and Daily Mail. It's, it's everywhere, essentially. You know, it's not just I've read this on some random blog of like naysayers, but the lockdown is going to last till summer, um, which is, you know, just beyond depressing at, at this point. But what I love about Van Morrison uh, is kind of the antithesis to celebrity culture that really during this lockdown, like before it used to be, oh, you know, it's quite interesting. Sometimes the sort of celeb gossip thing um, didn't find it that irritating, but now it's really come to sort of, I've just come to detest it. And it's great to see Van Morrison not biting his tongue and really just not giving a shit about mm. how he comes across in, in the kind of Hollywood elites that, that have literally had how how is it that everybody regardless of like where they're from what political beliefs they have in general um what opinions they have what personality traits they have every single person in Hollywood all major musicians all major actors pretty much everyone how is it that everybody has exactly the same opinion as to how <laughs> we're going to deal with this pandemic it would yeah. be great if like we had people saying different things people because we all look up to these people i mean there have been some major musicians who you know i used to look up to and i just think you know what are you doing to help the smaller artists yeah it's well it's depressing because i think what's happened is that any that there's been a kind of demonization of skepticism so anyone who calls themselves a lockdown skeptic um or says something critical of the strategy of lockdown is now basically called a denier or you're you know I remember the time when people were talking about herd immunity the whole idea of what you know people like Professor Carol Sikora or Sunitra Gupta were talking about in relation to other strategies of the Great Barrington Declaration which was basically to say you shield and uh, give up resources and prioritize care for all the vulnerable and then basically let people like you and I who are healthy young people go out and get the virus and you develop herd immunity and uh, anyone who was arguing that was is now been posed as evil kind of granny killing ho horrendous immoral um people who have to be shut down and of course that's not the case at all and when you mix in the fact that there's lots of people pointing to even even the most ardent lockdown um kind of pro lockdown people say and 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 kind of and can admit to the fact that there is little evidence to show that these prolonged lockdowns actually do have an effect and we all know that it's a kind of a delay tactic and mm. at the first lockdown it was to protect the nhs and you thought okay get all our ducks in a row and make sure we're set up for this lockdown okay that's that seems like the right idea of short sharp lockdown you know almost a year later and you're thinking okay can you maybe try some other ideas or certainly in relation to the vaccination there's now that as you said there's a suggestion that we won't come out of lockdown until summer but i mean the promise why, was why would that be the case yeah as well? the promise was when that once they vaccinate the elderly and the vulnerable the medically vulnerable and key workers and things like that then things start to open up and if they don't follow through on that promise i think it's really important to hold them to it because it's not you know i'm i'm totally sympathetic with um live musicians and the whole scene i don't want that to die i don't want artists to suffer there is there is an often a, a kind of great amount of attention paid to them when there's not there's not as much attention paid to you know for example uh people who don't do glamorous jobs who are losing that you know there's, there's been a lot of talk about hospitality workers but what about other people cleaners who work in big conference centers who suddenly have had all their jobs cut i mean things that is the knock-on effects of lockdown also have to be talked about and i don't have the answers it's, it's, it's a very it's a very disempowering time when you feel like i don't like what's happening i don't agree with what's happening but i don't have any i don't want to go out and dissent i don't want to go i don't want to go out and take off my mask and do all this ridiculous stuff that some people do you know i don't want to hmm. you don't want to make a show you want to play your part in defeating this virus but you just feel like your hands are tied behind your back and you can't if you say anything, you're going to spark outrage on social media. So it's no yeah. wonder that celebrities, like you've been saying, or lots of people. They just, just don't want the hassle, do they? Just towing the line, yeah. 
And it's, yeah, it's depressing. just a shame that there's no, the, the most rock and roll person in the world is Van Morrison. I mean, it's not a shame because he's, <laughs> you know, he's a poet and an incredible singer. And, you know, my respect for him has gone up. Even if you just disagree with Van Morrison, even if you think, yeah, I mean, as you say, that there are people lower down the food chain than, than Van Morrison who need to get back to work, whose livelihoods have been wiped out. You know, the, the issue here isn't that Van Morrison can't go back to playing cozy residencies at Caesar's Palace. The issue is is a bigger one, but it's just to have pretty much only him. I think Eric Clapton featured on one of the singles. Mm. He said, you know, we all admire Van for what he's doing. And I think the reaction to to that was to <laughs> for some sections of the media to start dredging up an incident in the 70s when Clapton was extremely drunk on stage and made some like very bad, distasteful and racist um, comments. Mm. Um, but like hit the sort of like unrelated, yeah, as unrelated if that's rele relevant rock, to lockdown. Yeah. It's not related <laughs> whatsoever. And uh, yeah. you know he's written about it at length, apologised. I mean, there's nothing more that he he can do. He doesn't seem remotely racist, Eric Clapton. Mm. But you know, it's just weird how they'll that some sections of the media will do anything to attack voices that that dissent in in any way. Um, so one one question I've got is. So let's say the lockdown lasts, you know, being negative till the summer. And then, you know, same thing happens as, as last year, opens up a bit in the summer, then we're back in lockdown over the winter, cases get worse because this is seasonal. Um, the, the, the virus mutates, the vaccines aren't working as well as hoped. And we're more or less, let's say, hypothetically in this situation, January 2022, at what point do you think people are are going to sort of chime in and say, okay, maybe we should try something different. How, like how many, how many years, cause we're coming up to the one year anniversary of this. How many years do you think it would take of this before, before consensus changed on lockdowns? <laughs> That's a very tricky question, <laughs> but the way, I mean, the way I've been thinking about it is <clears throat> it's the, the whole idea of consent has been really strange in how we understand it throughout the last year. Uh, because obviously you usually have, um, you know, you usually have, uh, or put it this way, we started 2020 uh, with a government that at least uh, on the face of it had claimed to having, you know, mass support with the Conservatives have won this kind of landslide. Um, I'm not a fan of the Conservatives, but it certainly was based on their kind of promises around Brexit. And anyway, there was a sense of you have a government that has a majority, that has the ear of the people and is ready to go. But the, because of the pandemic, you've had uh, the relationship between voters and politicians basically cut off i mean obviously we don't have we don't have that much of a relationship with them other than the ballot box usually but the isolation of the kind of uh, the the last nine ten months has meant that the only way that we've had any kind of say in what's happening at a time when you know countless laws have been passed massive changes in the social situation you know the cancellation of education the can this kind of people being taken away from their jobs all these massive changes in society and the only way they've ascertained that we are consenting to this is through kind of these bizarre press conferences and the odd YouGov poll and you know every every idiot can pull a poll out their backside and say ah oh, but I know that you know the 58 percent of the general public say that they want to wear masks on Sundays but they want to you know it's just it's the most infuriating thing it's making a mockery of of democracy um, and there's even suggestion now that elections in the future might be postponed might be put off because um, of the fact that you know you can't have the proper workings under lockdown restrictions and at some you know at some point you do have to say you know we need to, I don't know whether it's a vote on this or we need to have some kind of public input because at the moment politicians are just kind of making it up as they go along in terms of in terms of interpreting public consent because none of them are talking to anyone they're not they're not doing what they're meant to do which is go and have their kind of uh, their meetings in their constituencies they're not meant to, they're meant to have kind of public meetings they're meant to be interacting with people they're meant to be getting a feel on the street of what people are thinking none of them are doing any of that because they're not allowed and so no one knows which is why you get talking about polls these kind of this very weird situation where several polls have showed that you know, lots, you know, lots of people support lockdown restrictions and they think themselves that they're doing the right 
thing. They say, yes, I'm following restrictions, but the same amount of people will say, but I'm very suspicious that no one else in society is following restrictions. And there's this kind of gray area where people are saying, well, how is it spreading? Because I know that I'm being very virtuous and moral and washing my hands and, you know, keeping my two meters distance. But I think my neighbor over there isn't. And there's just a huge amount of kind of, to put it simply, sort of bad vibes in the air where people, mm. the isolation and atomization of that was happened throughout the lockdown, which, you know, in some cases has been necessary to prevent the virus from killing people, has had a knock on effect of this kind of twisting of, of our interaction with each other and uh, more importantly, actually, our interaction with the levers of power in society. So I, I don't, I, I'm sort of, don't like admitting this, but I'm kind of pessimistic about um, people reacting to this because and it's because of the simple fact that the fear factor around this virus has been ramped up to such an extreme um, occasionally actually in ways which is really unhelpful and unnecessary so I mean we all now know that it's a very serious virus that can kill people or make people very seriously ill but the sort of the the panic and the um, guilt tripping from politicians messaging to people to say like so if you go to even just visit your granny through a glass screen that you're you're sort of being destructive against the um public pushback against the virus or that if you um you know break the rules or bend the rules and decide that you're going to go into work for one day or whatever it is that you're kind of evil the fear factor around it has i think really made people feel not not just scared of the virus but scared of being outed as a covid idiot or whatever they're calling people mm. these days and so i can i can kind of get i have this sort of underlying feeling that people are just hunkering down and keeping their head down and that's that's really bad because that means that change is happening all around you and you're not having any input into um into what that change is and i mean just finally i mean the introduction of emergency powers and emergency laws have happened in the past and when they happen and get implemented it's it's very often that they remain on the statute books is it's very uh difficult once these laws are passed to roll them back and we've i mean we've seen that things that were meant to be you know talked about as reviewed the kind of increase in policing increase in fines um increase in criminalizing things like socializing um, were meant to be reviewed but they're just rolling on and on and on and we're obviously we're told it's in order to fight back against the virus you might think okay but the that we have to keep a sharp eye on those things because they you know normality has to come back and that's not a new normal that's normality which means that you're not looking over your shoulder when you sit down on the bench for a coffee with your mum and you're not looking over your shoulder when you cough in a public place you know that mm. normality like that has to has to return and we are going to have to demand it back that's the important point yeah i really feel that we will have to demand it back but i feel like there's very few people who seem to be interested in that which is why I'm kind of very curious as to, because I don't think it's going to change this year. We are so far away from this changing. Change, especially in this country, does not happen overnight. So when something, when we're, when we're in a very bad situation like this, like we are in a full lockdown now, they're saying it's not going to be lifted till at least Easter, probably longer than that. So, you know, it's going to be out of that into tears, out of tears into whatever, then we might need to go back. I mean, to go back to what you described, not as a new normal, but to normal, I mean, we are a world away from that and no one seems to care. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they do care, but they just think the price is worth worth paying. And of course, you know, it is important to know as as you have that this is a serious virus and people do die. But, it, you know, I, I don't think it, it requires saying that out of anything other than fear that people think that you're a COVID idiot because, mm -hmm. you know, we all know that and we all feel terrible for the people who are losing their lives and we're not and, and i don't think anybody who wants to ask questions or try and get back to normal um is is even suggesting to not take restrictions or even you know so in some cases this isn't an argument against lockdown it, particularly it's just more kind of asking questions about lockdown asking questions about when lockdown might end and why and how mm -hmm. because at the moment it seems very unclear as to why lockdown is going to end yeah and that's that is a really key point because the goalposts keep shifting so yeah. 
you know, like I said, back in March, lockdown was explained on the basis of giving us a kind of, you know, the whole flatten the curve thing. But it was basically about giving the NHS enough of, of breathing space to be able to react to this new thing that had suddenly hit the world, coronavirus, that nobody really knew that much about. And the facts were all changing and scientists were kind of uh, trying to figure it out. And so you thought, OK, the goalposts were this is about giving us breathing space and then you know when it came to Christmas it was about saving Christmas and then Christmas got cancelled anyway for us in London anyway and then now it's about uh the new strain and so that you know you accept that because this is a novel virus everything keeps shifting and so you you have to be flexible um but the problem is it I, I feel like there's not a lot of flexibility from the very ardent pro lockdowners who um who aren't as you say open to having any kind of questioning or there's this very insulting idea of the public as not being able to handle different points of view so the idea is you know if you listen to i mean talk radio got banned if you listen to someone on talk radio talking about the fact that you know making the argument that maybe the consequences of lockdown might outweigh the risks of the virus itself which is an opinion that some people have that you'll suddenly think oh i've just heard you know julie hartley brewer say this so i'm gonna go out and you know um not wash my hands and lick everything in my corner shop i mean there's this really mm. insulting view of the public as not being able to take in information and make decisions for ourselves and make sensible decisions and come to some kind of a consensus but the the, the really the tricky thing is um, that I think is is kind of disingenuous is that we have two messages going on at the same time. One is that you know Chris Whitty keeps saying this that coronavirus is going to be with us for a long time. That this is something we're going to have to live with. That like you said, it's seasonal. When the winter comes round again uh, in you know this November December 2021, that we're going to be dealing with this. That they're going it's there's going to be a resurgence. All that kind of stuff that we has been explained to us. But then at the same time, everything that we're dealing with at the moment in terms of restrictions and responses to them is, is really short-termist. So it's all about the next two weeks and everything is presented to us as you know little blocks of time. This is up until spring, up until as if it's kind of sectioned off, making out like there is an end in sight. Yeah, but which is the completely untrue. Which is untrue. And so then you have to say, well, if we are going to have to live with this, you know, not to compare the virus in its uh, in its effect to the flu, but if you have something seasonal like the flu that's going to come around, if coronavirus is going to be something similar that will be in the population for the future, to, you know, years to come, if that's going to be the case, that's depressing. But how do we deal with it? How do we yeah. how do we uh, deal with the risk? And it's risk that I think people are most afraid of at the moment. Um, you know the but there's no scope or space for talking about balancing risks about, you know, for example, young people who are the most, uh, the least at risk physically from the virus. There's, there's no scope for talking about the possibility of us being allowed to, or like university students or school students, whoever it is being allowed to go out and uh, be a bit freer and keep back the more at risk people. There's, there's no flexibility around that discussion and we are going to have to deal with risk at some point or we stay at home in bunkers forever i mean that that seems to be that the is the reality the of the situation and also there's very little data being published in mainstream news outlets such such as you know the, the extent of that that people who i talk to you know they don't know the average age of, of fatalities they don't know the percentage of those fatalities that have underlying health conditions of some kind they don't know the number of people under, you know, the age of 60 without underlying health conditions who have died. Um, and I'm not going to kind of regurgitate those statistics in an attempt to make an argument for questioning lockdown, but I would encourage all my listeners to look up those type of statistics and kind of read around the narrative, you know, that's being presented that, that is very one-sided. That There was this, um, something that you mentioned earlier about you know habits changing and sort of people looking over their shoulders and there bit generally being bad vibes in the air um i think i i remember i think it might have been when i was trying to give up smoking or something like that i i kind of was reading all these articles about behavioral um you know changing your habits and things and i i read something about it taking over 60 days or something like 66 days after that you know you, you can embed new habits in yourself you can change your habits 
So like, obviously we've been living like this for longer than 66 days. Do you, do you think that, you know, quite, quite a while into the future, we're definitely going to get portions of society where, yeah, if you cough, if you're just generally a bit sniffly, if you sit too close to people, you're going to have people, you know, even if things go well long after the virus is gone, you're going to have people sort of going, Oi mate, like stand a bit further away or, or you yeah. know, what are you doing? That's so unsafe about yeah. pretty small things. Well, there's already the suggestion. I think it was um, Patrick Valance or it might have been Jonathan Van Tam suggested that the idea of wearing masks might be beneficial in some places moving forward. So this, so something, you know, lots of people have taken the piss out of people being upset about wearing a mask and said, for God's sake, it's just, it's just a thing you have to do. Just do it. Why would you cause such a fuss about it? Mm. But the idea that moving forward after, say, after the, the immediate threat of the pandemic is over, that we might institute wearing masks on the tube or in, you know, packed venues um, to prevent things like the flu, they said, or to prevent other kind of uh, viruses spreading. I mean, that it, people underestimate. I, I wear a mask. I've, I've consented to that. I do it on the tube. I do it, you know, wherever people, where, wherever you're meant to do it. Um, but the idea that it is, it's kind of nothing to cover your face is horrible because actually even something on the tube, you know, it's kind of going against the stereotype of London as being uh, antisocial on the tube. You really notice the kind of feeling of isolation with everyone covered up and everyone not looking at each other and everyone sort of sitting apart. It doesn't feel good. It, it, you miss being able to catch people's eye. You miss being able to see someone smile. Um, all of that kind of human interact. We're social beings, you know, to kind of get deterministic about it, but we are. And all of that is terrible. I mean, it's really horrible seeing kids wearing masks and you kind yeah. of like, I'd usually stick my tongue out at little girls and boys going down the street or like make them laugh. And you can't do that anymore. And the idea that that would become normal is terrible. And it does have an effect on um, on the way we interact. I mean, you mentioned smoking. A huge amount of this idea of, um, of being kind of risk averse or safety conscien conscious or having a kind of precautionary principle of saying, well, we shouldn't do something just in case there is a bad effect has been embedded in public health for years. So, I mean, around smoking, uh, I used to be a smoker and the, the obsession with things like passive smoking. I mean, the whole bands on smoking, talk about the live music scene. I mean, the whole, the whole <laughs> clamp down on smoking has been dreadful for pubs, dreadful for live uh, ve music venues, dreadful for the whole kind of social scene. Um, the panic about passive smoking and the idea that you just create a kind of risky environment for everyone within a mile of you having a fag is was ridiculous the whole obsession with uh the sugar tax and people eating um sugary things and banning them from checkout corners all that kind of this this overreach of uh public health england and overreach of the state into people's personal lives on the basis of health and on the basis of safety has been happening for a long time i mean in relation to women which is something that i write about a lot i mean you can see really good examples or really bad examples of this for example there's a kind of an obsession with women breastfeeding instead of bottle feeding there's even laws around um preventing uh, formula milk from being advertised on the basis of trying to get women to breastfeed when they have babies and at the heart of it is this basically idea that the the state uh government or eu law wherever it comes from has a better sense of how you should live your life than you do and that has infected the discussion around coronavirus because it's saying yeah. rather than you for example you know going to see your your great aunt or someone and and decide the, the two of you deciding that she doesn't want to sit with you in full ppe that she's happy to take the risk that you want to be able to hug each other with that rather than you and your family being able to make or you and your friends being able to make that decision um moving forward when we've when we've gotten away from the immediate threat you're in you're having kind of a safety conscience a safety conscious view enforced on you and uh, that's kind of like you don't get alarmist but sort of almost moving to a biosecurity state it's like what what will they decide is unhealthy or dangerous next um yeah. and, and, and also i mean uh, you know i hate to be pessimistic but we're all going to die at the end of it anyway so <laughs> <laughs> so it just feels like uh, yeah this, this has just made me think you know i never want to eat a healthy meal again <laughs> I literally just want to go on a bender lasting about five years um, and just eat every piece of junk food in sight. 
because it's just it is just it's and i'm in a lucky position i haven't lost my income i just can't even begin to imagine people who are, you know it's not been great for my mental health but mm. you know, i can't even begin to imagine for people who already have, were suffering before this in just the normal world which was pretty hard um mm. for most people who mm. like worked for decades to lose their to only lose their small businesses to you know the, the landlords and landladies who've lost the pubs that they you know invested their lives into or you know just what 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 is the statistic i think six million people run sort of small companies in the uk and like mm -hmm. so many of them are struggling and then the people who work for them basically the whole private sector um mm -hmm. have been screwed over whilst those in the public sector i mean it was van morrison who wrote i think on twitter remember that the lockdown is being imposed by people who haven't missed a paycheck since march yeah it would be funny you know if you just said right we're suspending all politicians pay till life goes back to normal I think that'd be a great way of dealing with it. You know, let's just say Boris and no one else is allowed any money until everybody else in the public, uh, you know, in the private sector, all the general public are back to normal financially, then you can get paid again. Simple. Well, the thing about the financial side of this is that because the, the you know, the social side of it is very important and um, people being, you know, have, being starved of social interaction can, in some cases, when people have existing mental health problems, you know, make them really spiral downwards mm. or even just kind of normal people, you, you uh, normal people, I mean, people who don't have mental health, existing mental health issues who consider themselves to be generally mentally healthy are starting to crack even, you know, like I'm getting sick of the sight of myself. I, I can't spend any more time alone with my thoughts um but the financial side of it is something that's kind of it's really worrying me because we are at the moment just living in a bubble um where you have these you know very necessary measures like furlough you have all the uh, people being kind of that uh, people sort of being having almost like a stay of execution because you kind of know in the back of your head that lots of these companies when furlough ends are going to end up sacking people and so you're, yeah. we're waiting for a big collapse and the people who are going to suffer at the um are not those of us who have you know been able to work from home and do a bit of yoga zoom and do a bit of this do a bit of that but it'll be people who for whom uh you know losing a paycheck means losing your house it'll be it'll be the working class of this country who suffer for this and there's been really no recognition of the fact that that crisis is is coming or it's kind of been kind of, it, it the the arguments around it is like, for example, the Labour Party saying, oh, we need to give you get first, we need to keep the 20 extra 20 quid on universal credit, you know, like, as if that makes any long term difference to anyone's quality of life. It's just yeah. talked about in such paltry terms. Um, and and by the way, these are the same people who are saying we should lock down harder and for longer. And you just think, do you not understand what is causing the problem here? Pitiful. What's what, what the problem has been caused by putting a stop to life and again like i have, feel like i have to keep re repeating myself in saying that i don't have necessarily a i you know I, not many people have a way out of this i don't have a roadmap to say don't do it this way do it that way i mean i still kind of agree with the great barrington declaration i think that there should be a more targeted focused approach to this but one thing's for sure i mean you have uh you have the kind of government clamping down in ways which it just seems unnecessary so like stopping stopping people from kind of click and collect stopping people from doing takeaways in some instances you know clamping down in ways in which stopping people from finding innovative ways of staying on at work um yeah, yeah. it's just pointless it's just yeah. making it even worse for people and it's pitiful the way um Keir Starmer has has, has gone about this I think and and you know there's and, and the media I I find that you know it's it's great to to have them doing what they consider to be the responsible thing of getting people to take this virus seriously, which they've, you know, six, definitely succeeded at that. Um, but I do feel that where are the stories about, about people who've, who've, you know, uh, who are struggling financially, where, where are the stories about people who've lost their jobs? Mm -hmm. Where's the coverage? I haven't seen any coverage at all, mm -hmm. apart from maybe a bit on talk radio. Mm -hmm. There was a lockdown story today that was pretty heartbreaking um but you know that this type of stuff should be on the bbc i've seen some pretty unimportant stuff um on the bbc news app which you know my girlfriend reads religiously every every morning 
Um, and uh, I mean, usually to sort of say that how shit it is, but you know, it, it's just remarkable that there's been from our major broadcaster, there's been no coverage whatsoever of, of the people who are struggling, who have lost their jobs or, you know, it would be good to hear about it. Mm. Or if there has been coverage, it's been, it's centered around mental health, which, you know, in one way is good because it reflects that there is that issue, but it feels like the only way that you can point to there being a problem is if you say this person is going mad rather than saying, actually, no, I'm not quite going mad yet, but I am really worried about my savings draining because I haven't been able to work. Or I am really worried about the fact that my kid hasn't been able to play with another kid in, you know, like my cousin has two very small children who one of them hasn't, isn't of nursery age yet. And she hasn't played with another little girl in a year and it's making her behavior strange. She just, she needs to be able to play with another little kid. She, cause she's sick of looking at her dad um, who can't give her the stimulation and the interaction that, that her fellow peers can. I mean, yeah. you don't have to characterize this in terms of, it shouldn't be as crude as, is there a mental health crisis? It's, you know, it, 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 it can't just be that extreme. There is also the whole range of ways when people are experiencing this. And there's also lots of people who, you know, I think the thing that I'm hopeful about is that I think the minute that the restrictions do lift, and as you've talked about them, you know, being extended till summer, there are some rumors that it will be, or only made the government's trying to make out that in some ways Boris Johnson's planning, promising, his fingers may be crossed behind his back that spring <laughs> Easter will be um, a time where restrictions might be lifted. Uh, you never know. I think that people are so desperate to break out of this that I hope that it's not necessarily that there'll be a resilience, but that people will bounce back, will want to bounce back, will want to get back to that kind of normality. Um, and so there will be a, you know, like that I'm hoping that the summer of 2021 will be one we'll never forget because there will just, everyone will want to be putting on shows and venues. And I work with the Academy of Ideas and our festival, the Battle of Ideas, which is an annual one, which has been going on for a sort of 13 or more years it didn't happen last year it's going to be postponed this year and it's a big politics festival that we usually have about three or four thousand people at you know mm. we want to put on the mother of all battle of idea festivals you want i think people want to break out and do this and so if if we allow um that to happen and harness that kind of energy in a way and say yeah put on a put on a music uh sh you know put on a sh concert in your shed do do weird things let's be exciting about it i'm hoping that will propel us forward rather than sinking deeper into the depression into of negativity yeah feeling yeah I, th there doesn't need to be as well if if there's been coverage on mental health that that is great and mental health is an important issue but i mean I almost feel just like it's just another one of one of these sort of trendy buzzwords that are used yeah. by people, you know, like it's on, it is on the BBC app quite a lot, mental health as a sort of buzzword. I mean, some people don't want to say kind of, yeah, I've, I've got, I struggle with my mental health and to sort of come across as like really self-indulgent. I mean, some people might just say, yeah, I'm really not enjoying low or, I'm yeah. really low I'm I'm mm. really not enjoying life at the moment and I haven't been for a while and you know I think that's how a lot of people feel feel about it but it's just almost like it seems like veganism it just <laughs> it just seems like another thing that that they're sort of hanging their hat on as this is such a wonderful new um turn of events in modern life that we're just going to use use the these buzzwords all the time um mm. But yeah, as you say, hopefully there can be a, a, a positive way forward. I wanted to get quickly your your two cents on, um, you know, the hope for a new era in in America. Um, I'm I'm going to be in America shortly, and so I was I was wonder wondering what, uh, you know, how you enjoyed the inauguration yesterday. Um, I, I I thought Lady Gaga reminded me of my uh, my karaoke tour of. Uh, of, of the US. I'm I am really nervous about slagging off Lady Gaga because I wrote this Telegraph article this week about the inauguration before <laughs> it happened, um, which was making what I thought was quite a serious point about the shallowness of the Biden um, administration and the reliance on celebrity and why it wasn't going to be a good challenge to Trump and Trumpism. Um, but in the, at the at the end, I kind of had a little dig and said, you know, <laughs> when Gaga takes the mic switch over, and I have been 
just subject to an onslaught of the weirdest and darkest Lady Gaga fan hatred for the last few days. I've they're like keep she, she's she's done she did some kind of yeah, she did some kind of I think it's just like a German song about a monster. And anyway, they keep sending me these like exorcist pictures of her. So I'm not going to slag off Lady Gaga. But yeah, yeah. The whole I mean, thing... she's, she is talented, uh, Lady Gaga. And yeah. I'm, not, I'm not looking I to save my own hide by saying this. Like, I do like <laughs> some of her songs. But, but I, um, I, I did, yeah, I, it was just a bit like, I don't know, I didn't really enjoy that. The thing about it was, and it was the same with the, uh, the kind of... Um, some of the conventions or the the kind of towards the end of the um presidential race was that i mean trump try trump is a kind of hollowed out celebrity and he tried to do and no one will perform at any of his events because the <laughs> names of trump so slightly different but all yeah. the celebrities lining up behind biden and the whole kind of celebrating america with tom hanks and all of that kind of pizzazz um is you know it's some in some ways traditional inaugurations and got have always had galas and shows and dances and there have been as i pointed out in my telegraph article some great musical gaffes over the years i mean when beyonce performed at last to um about um, barack and michelle obama dancing at his inauguration and then etta james chimed in and said hang on a minute why have you asked her to sing my song and she said something like i'm gonna whoop her ass because she was so angry <laughs> um but it's yeah. always had that kind of element to it but the thing about i mean talking about the f hope for the future of america the thing about the way in which it's just that i think people can feel a bit like what we're talk we have been talking about about the intolerance towards lockdown criticism or skepticism whatever you want to call it is that people can feel that there's this sense of everyone just gravitates to biden and the democrats because it's the right thing to do because it's kind of right on i mean forgetting the fact that this is a guy who has a political record that you know would uh, you know that would rival some ukip members over here he's kind of he has been in Cent central to previous presidential um, campaigns around law and order. I mean, the, in, in the Clinton years, you know, he's been involved in law changes that have paved the way for the mass incarceration of black men in America. I mean, the same with Kamala Harris and her history as a kind of top cop. These people have really, from my point of view anyway, really bad politics. I mean, Biden's deeply involved in the Iraq war, all of that. He, and then on a more kind of, uh, what I would take less seriously note, the kind of various allegations of him being creepy Joe Biden, serious allegations of him uh, assaulting people, all of that just gets hushed under the carpet mm. because he's not Trump. And in that way, I don't have hope, um, really, for America, because I think what's why, happened why is... Are they, why are they doing that? I mean, you know, obviously Trump, like the thing is, it's just like there's so much criticised about Trump. And yeah, it's pathetic that he couldn't, he, he, he turned himself into such a detestable figure that mm. he couldn't even get a Bruce Springsteen tribute band to perform <laughs> yeah. at his inauguration. I mean, that is pathetic. There are, there are some pretty prevalent themes that that Biden and Kamala Harris seem to have kind of jumped on the bandwagon of that they yeah. didn't seem to stand for beforehand. I mean, Trump, if he was so vacuous and narcissistic, could have could have done the same thing. I mean, he is narcissistic in in different, <laughs> equally troublesome ways, but it is just a bit weird how we've, we're painting Biden as this amazing or kind principled of stand up of guy. Yeah, they both play the identity politics line. I mean, Trump played it with a with a you know really quite ugly crowd in relation to the whole kind of white nationalist storming the capital um, and did the whole kind of make a, the MAGA hats thing. All of that was about not just kind of patriotism, which you could make argues for and against, but he played into the um, identity politics role as, you know, in a way and, and more so towards the end of his term. But the Biden administration and the Democrats have, you know, we saw this with Hillary Clinton um, when she was running against Trump playing the kind of, you know, doing the whole joke about the woman card. Um, but they kind of weaponize identity politics. So this whole kind of, you know, and Biden fails at it, by the way, his whole the various gaffes he did across the uh, presidential race when he was sort of saying, if you haven't picked between me and Trump yet, then you ain't black to a, to a black radio host or like saying, you know, are you on drugs to another another i think it was black uh tv host i mean he just he he's somebody who someone has told to be woke and he can't quite get it into his head how yeah, to yeah. be woke and so keeps screwing up but they they really are operating on that basis i mean just 
cannot stomach the idea that Kamala Harris is being celebrated um, as, yes, factually, she is the first black uh, woman to be the vice president of South Asian descent, whatever people keep talking about. Yes, she's also somebody who has done a huge amount to the detriment of black people in America via her um, work in in relation to law and order. I mean, it's, you, it's this whole, it's the shallowness of it that is really annoying. I mean, they're not just annoying, it's infuriating. That's why Hillary Clinton was such a grotesque figure in my view, because she's someone that has really not uh, got anything going for her in terms of you know policies for women, anything around uh, abortion, anything around healthcare, anything around childcare. And yet she had this whole kind of, oh, I'm grandma figure. I'm, you know, I'm the woman for women. And it's just like, no, it you're just not. Felt so, so clumsy and, it's, and insincere. It's shallow, yeah. And, and the problem is, America is incredibly divided right now along these lines because what you have is, you know, things like the Black Lives Matter movement, which are, which you know, are in some way, in in some ways, based in a reality of a police brutality against Black people and racism in America, very real issues, um, which are going to being framed in these in the politics of identity. So you have on the one hand, people saying, yes, you should not uh, kill black people in police um, in police custody. And also don't talk about my hair, you know, these kind of total lumping and of everything about a discussion about race into one. And on the other side, you then have people mirroring that, which is saying, oh, well, you know, you're being racist against whites. And it ends up in this really kind of ugly soup of identity politics, rather than people talking about things, you know, traditional principles, not traditional principles, but universal principles like political solidarity, political equality, saying, you know, it's now controversial to say things like, it doesn't matter if you're black or white, we're going to fight for freedom. You know, that that's now kind of being, uh, exercising your white privilege or do, doing silence is violence or whatever they say it is. If you if you talk about universalism and the Democrats are invested in deepening that divide. I mean, they really are. It, they, they may not be say, calling people deplorables like Hillary Clinton did back in 2016, but it's very clear that they're still invested in that. The whole, you know, vengeful- seems to be worse, doesn't it? The vengeful kind of push to impeach Trump, which is basically, it's got nothing to do with Trump. It's basically saying to Trump voters, you know, ha, you know, you lost. And then ignoring the fact that massive number of people voted for Trump. So it's just, it's, I think that, I think there are bad times to come in American politics, um, bad times to come for American democracy. Trump made a mockery of it um, with his attacks on it, but but with their push for impeachment, the Democrats aren't, aren't far behind him in undermining democracy. So I'm not hopeful. Yeah, it, I'm glad to see the back of Trump because at, I think at best he was a distraction from getting any kind of real change in America. And at worst, he was a kind of uh, an unstable nightmare. Um, yeah. But, but I, there's, you could, wild horses could not drag me to cheer for Biden or Kamala Harris. Yeah, and, and I've got to say, and, and, and I'm sure there are some people who feel the same way. It's, it's just, and obviously, you know, even Trump said, wished, I mean, it probably wasn't genuine, wished the new administration a lot. Um, it definitely wasn't genuine. But, uh, but, you know, like people obviously want America to come together and do well. But I think for people who are having a shit time, whether it's in the US or the UK, it is just very difficult to read some of the media coverage um, and, and to just watch some of the behavior by people in the public eye who are preaching, preaching to us um, without actually, you know, physically being sick. I mean, I've read this article yesterday. I think it was it two days ago, whenever the, I think the inauguration was yesterday. Yeah. There was an article um, uh, written by Piers Morgan. And this is a guy who literally was mates with Trump throughout his presidency and used to sort of brag about having phone calls with, with Donald Trump. Uh, this is this is a guy you know who who basically boasted about being friends with him, and he just wrote this this thing being like, "Oh, I choked up, and if you didn't, you don't have a heart." Such was <laughs> such was the power, emotional power of Joe Biden's speech, which was like the best speech that I've ever heard. And it's just, it actually feels like being you know back at school or something, and and you know and just being in the group of like losers in the corner. Um, part of a minority of people that realise that 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 the popular kids are are actually complete assholes. <laughs> it's like being gaslighted. Yeah, it's like you're like being told, no, you're if you don't 
if you don't see the beauty in this, if you don't see how amazing this is, then you're you're wrong or you're kind of immoral or you're prejudiced and you're kind of, you know, looking around. And I mean, this has always happened in American politics. Obama, um, as a great example, is a politician who, and a president who deported, you know, more people than Trump ever could have wished for. Um, and was, uh, you know, in terms of foreign policy, far more hawkish and far more frightening in terms of being interventionist. And he's celebrated as, you know, as kind of like the, um, you know, the favorite dad of America. You know, everyone loves him. He's so stylish. Why, why, loves why is that? Bummer. Just because he, he releases an annual Spotify playlist. <laughs> But that that is that is the the confusing um, issue. So I mean, you know, what what hope do the people have, and and what you know, where can people um, read articles that you've written? You 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 write the spiked, don't you? Yes, I'm a columnist at Spiked, and Spiked um, have had have taken a um, very defined line of uh, publishing people who are critical of the lockdown, not all of it. I agree with, but not, you know, or not all of it. Everyone will agree with that's the brilliant thing about Spiked is that they are very uh, committed 100% with no ifs and no buts. That's the um, slogan to freedom of speech. And so in terms of going anywhere for a kind of different take on actually most political ideas, whether it be the kind of sickness of the inauguration, the sick makingness of the inauguration, um, to the politics of lockdown and the dealing with the pandemic, Spiked always has a, a Spiked, I think, anyway, maybe I'm prejudiced, always has a, makes you step back and think um, and question your own points of view. Um, and I've also right now for the Telegraph and the Critic, um, I mainly actually do stuff in relation to music and the arts for um, the Critical. Whenever anything gets banned, I tend to churn out an article saying why it's wrong to ban it. <laughs> um, but I think there are, you know, the, the funny thing is that our lives have been drawn so small um, and in the pandemic that really the only way we're all interacting is either on, you know, social media or Zoom or things like this. And so places like Twitter and Facebook have kind of become the adopted public square. And, and I remember talking about this at the time that Brexit happened. I remember saying there has a kind of been a reinvigoration of political life. Um, people care about what's going on in the world. You know, there's, it's an exciting time. Um, political change is happening. I think, I think that's slightly shifted or deflated now. <laughs> but I think that it's still true that, you know, even if you look at the numbers of people that are tuning into these boring as hell press conferences that where they just churn out the same platitudes, but the important point is that people are keeping an eye on what's going on. They do care. They are listening every time that Matt Hancock says something uh, a bit dodgy or tries to guilt trip people. And so I'm, I don't think people are going to roll over and take this. I don't know what shape the bounce back is going to take. Um, and maybe you could argue that the exciting thing about politics is that you never really know what's going to happen until it happens. Um, but I think that there's enough people with sense um, out there in the masses, not many people believe in the sense of the masses that I do, that know that this can't go on forever and that know that they're, the promises that have been made about restrictions lifting, politicians must be held to them. I don't know how we're going to do it. I'm not so in trying to incite any kind of rebellion out on the streets, but there is, I think, a growing sense that we've had uh, that, you know, we know enough about the virus we know enough about the effects of lockdown to be able to start making some sensible decisions about how to move forward and i think people want to be involved in that discussion more debate about this and more skepticism actually about everything that you come across in in political life is is always better than less if you're enjoying the greatest music of all time podcast you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing if you're watching on youtube the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridland YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.